I live in Florida. And where were you uh, when the war broke out? I was in uh, college. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. I was at Notre Dame, and uh, I, September of 41, of course, when the term starts. And um, while we were there, many of us had enlisted in the ERC. ERC stands for Enlisted Reserve Corps. And we were told that we're in inactive, in, but inactive service. But this would allow us to complete four years of college and then go on, if you, to officer school and et cetera, et cetera. And it sounded great, but they lied to us. <laughs> well, they didn't lie. Uh, no one knew what was coming. And of course, Pearl Harbor happened, and uh, about a year or so after, I was only at Notre Dame about a year and a half, because it was shortened, because we went into active service. Uh, many of us got the call to come in the Grand Central Palace in New York for a physical, and, a, and uh, if we passed, we were sworn in. And I passed. But we had a famous guy, a guy by the name of Creighton Miller, and he was a running back. And he and his brother Tom were at the school at the same time, and interestingly enough, they were sons of Tom Miller, who was one of the four horsemen, Miller, Layden, uh, Crowley, and uh, Stoldreyer. And poor old Creighton couldn't make it. He had high blood pressure. <laughs> they put him in an ante room to try to bring it down, but it didn't happen, so he got a discharge. And he went back to Notre Dame and played football. <laughs> but I didn't have that. I didn't have high blood pressure. I was too healthy. I had to go. <coughs> and uh, I uh, went into Camp Dix in uh, New Jersey. <laughs> you want to hear crazy stuff, too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, I, I'm going to incriminate myself. We don't have to share this. <laughs> when we're finished, you can decide who gets to hear this and who doesn't. But we spent, uh, well, Camp Dix, then I went to, uh, they sent us down to Texas, Camp Fannin, Texas, near Tyler, Texas. Basic training, et cetera. And uh, then to ASTP, those of us, you had to take a test of some sort, if I remember correctly, and find out if you're eligible, you know. And I was sent up with a, bunch of other guys, including Ed Koch, who <laughs> wound up being the mayor of New York. And we were at Fordham University for about six months, ASTP training, taking engineering courses. And then I guess they needed cannon fodder, more bodies. <laughs> and uh, they cut out that program and then scattered us all in different parts of uh, different camps or whatever. And that's when I wound up in Camp Carson and uh, with the 104th Division. But and we were there for the, I guess it was 14 or 16 weeks, I forget, of training. And then, of course, we got the trip back east on trains to Camp Kilmer. And Camp Kilmer was about, I was living in Bayonne, New Jersey at that time. And it was about, oh, maybe an hour's drive or so, I don't know. And uh, we were there for, we didn't know how long we were going to be there. So they allowed us to have passes to go home and because we knew we were headed overseas. Well, I got a pass. I went home. <laughs> I had to get back to base. So my brother had a car. He said, take my car. I said, okay, good. So I took his car and I got back to Kilmer. And that night they said, no more communication with the outside, no telephone calls, 
we're leaving tomorrow morning. Or, I don't know if I have. Yeah, yeah, we're leaving. I thought, holy mackerel, I've got my brother's car. I can't tell him I, I'm, I'm going and I'm going to leave the car here. What do I do? Well, the only thing I can do is go AWOL. <laughs> and another, I don't remember his name, another guy who lived in the town next door, Jersey City, he had a girlfriend he wanted to see, so he went with me. <laughs> we went, we, we steadily went over to a depression under the fence, got out of the camp, drove into uh, Bayonne. I dropped him off at Jersey City. I went on to Bayonne. And I got my brother to take me back to the camp And early in the morning. And we got back to the camp, this other deserter and I, <laughs> About five o'clock in the morning, I think, we, we went back under the fence the way we had come in. <laughs> we got back to the barracks and everybody said, where have you been? We're re they were all packed up, ready to leave. Had all our gear ready. And, we, and I, I think about it, every time I think about it, I think, what if I had missed that? Wow. I'd probably been lined up in the circular fire squad or something. <laughs> yeah, so then of course came the trip across the uh, ocean, which was une uneventful, except it was kind of long, about 11 days or so. And uh, then in the Normandy, and uh, nothing spectacular, and so many guys went through the whole thing, you know. Uh, there was really nothing of any consequence. And of course, then our division was, uh, went on into um, Holland. Oh, the only, the only, the one thing I, I uh, enjoyed, while we were in Normandy, we were there maybe two or three weeks, they gave us some jobs to do, and our job was guarding a su supply trains from Cherbourg to Versailles. And uh, we were guarding them not against an enemy, but again, mostly I think against our own GIs, <laughs> because they carried all kinds of uh, goods, gasoline and cigarettes, and and uh, they'd break cars open or some, you know. So we had to. It was only about a. I forget how many miles it is, to maybe 60 miles, I think, from Cherbourg to Versailles. But it took like two or three days, because they'd side, put us on the uh, side rail if a troop train or something was coming through. And uh, that was a lot of fun in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, and even, even we, here yeah, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, they, what's his name? The uh, Secretary of Justice, what's he gonna? <laughs> Holder. <laughs> He's gonna hold me. Now, we, I remember one time we broke open a car. Why? Because it had Del Monte fruit cocktail in it. You know, we ate fruit cocktails. <laughs> but another night, uh, one of the, we caught a GI. We used to parade up, uh, not parade, but you know, guard, two of us with rifles and all. And we see this guy breaking, a, a GI breaking into one of the cars, pointed a gun at him. What are you doing there? What, what are you? At? Well, he says, I lost my raincoat. I need a raincoat. <laughs> so we told him, no, you can't have it. Go. <laughs> but uh, that was part of the uh, first thing we did. And then, of course, they were actually looking for our first. Uh, combat action, where we, they were going to send us. And uh, we wound up in, in Holland with the Canadian First Army and uh, fought on, in the dikes. The Dutch have these dikes that are like 10 feet high or so. And, and Oh, and the first, the first time we ever got fired at, we were 
walking through the Dutch countryside and all of a sudden, bang, artillery coming in on us. We all ran, scattered like rats, because we were new, we didn't know what to do, and, uh, but we survived it. And we wound up doing duty on, uh, sort of in a stalemate for a while. Uh, these dikes, we dug into the side of a dike, all of us, or other people with foxholes. And we were there for, I don't know, three or four days in preparation for a river crossing. And uh, during that time, the Germans were throwing mortar shells at us. <laughs> and uh, one night our command told us, all right, you fellas in the dike here, get out, out of your dike, get up on the top of the dike and start firing after dark, maybe around a minute out in front of you. And then there, we're going to send up a rocket, a flare, quit firing because then the other two companies are going to come out in a pincer sort of in front of you. So my buddy and I get up on the top of the dike and we're doing what we're told. And then we hear the mortars coming in, and they bracket the mortars. And they have observers when they throw in mortar shells. They know where they're hitting and where they've hit anything, and then they come the other side, and they finally zero in on you. So we're lying up there firing our rifles. He looks at me, I look at him. What do you think? Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> So we went down into a burrow, and I'll bet we weren't in there two or three minutes. Bam, all of a sudden. Flash of light, it lift, actually lifted us up off the ground, and when daylight came, oh, we looked at the hole, and it was right where the two of us had been lying. So we had a close call. One of our lieutenants and his runner had a closer call. They were both killed. A mortar shell came into their foxhole, chewed everything up like a grinder. Yeah. And uh, of course, then we crossed the river. And there's so many things I could talk about. I could talk about it all day. You don't want me to, though. We got lunch coming up. Uh, you have any uh, anything you want to ask me or? I I think um, talk about the Russians. Didn't you guys come in contact with the Russians? I never got in contact with the Russians because March the twenty sixth we had crossed the Rhine, and uh, I got wounded on March twenty sixth. It was at night, uh, some around sometime around midnight, and. Uh, None of us really knew what hit us, and the only we all surmised that it probably was, you know, you hear about today uh, IEDs. Uh, this in those days they were called something else, booby traps, and uh, they warned us uh, when we were in basic training: don't ever go into a ditch in an unfamiliar country or whatever, because the enemy, the Germans in this case, would have trip wires, and I think. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, we were walking this country road, and uh, I was a platoon guide, which meant I was at the rear of the platoon. I had been a platoon, uh, squad sergeant, and I got a promotion to staff and a platoon guide, and if I hadn't gotten that promotion, it wouldn't have happened to me. But because I was there, we're walking along, and I hear a commotion. I turn to see what's going on, and bam, a big flash of light. And next thing I know, I'm on the face down on the ground. One of the guys in the platoon behind us had stepped off the end of the ditch, and he finally died about three o'clock in the morning. They took us into a farmhouse, and a German man and woman boiled the hot water, <laughs> and our medics took care of us. You know. I think it hit about four of us. 
And I was mad because I didn't want to leave. The war, we all knew the war was about to end. It ended in May, middle of May. And this was March 26th. And I had heard stories that if, if you leave, you may not be able to come to the same outfit. I had all my buddies. I didn't want to, yeah, it's like starting over again. So, uh, but then when they told me I would be ZI'd, I felt better. ZI'd means zone of the interior, back to the States. Yeah. And another interesting story, when we were in, the, in Holland, we made a, a river crossing. And uh, we did it at night, or early morning. It was still early morning, but still dark. And we had to carry our, our assault boats to the river, and the river was running like crazy. So we all got in, maybe five or six, to a boat, and we made the crossing. And we were get, they were shooting at us from the other side, and we finally got ashore and started towards the objective. And we got pinned down by rifle fire, and our acting company commander, a guy by the name of Bill Dyer, great guy. And uh, <laughs> we're all lying in the field. Nobody wants to get up and get, be a target. Bill Dyer sta steps up, waves his 45 pistol. Come on, you guys, let's go. And we went. And it was a, so it was a kind of a difficult uh, crossing. And fast forward now a few to one of the conventions. We had a sergeant back in that op operation, and he came over to me, and he said, hey, Al, he said, you remember the time we were in the crossing of that river? And I said, certainly I remember. He said, well, you, he said, well, you're in it. Of course, I was. And, and he named a couple of the other guys who were in the boat. He said, well, he says, I got a, a bronze star for that uh, operation. I said, oh? And you know, he says, I could have gotten all you guys a bronze star, but I didn't think you'd care about it. I felt like punching him in the nose. <laughs> Not so much because I wanted a decoration, but every decoration or any, anything of that order gave you points. And the points you accumulated got you home quicker. <laughs> I, I don't think he's around anymore. I think he only came to one or, one or two conventions. But that, uh, that's something I remember. And I remember in Holland, too, we finally got in the, across that river. And uh, we were in a, a farmyard, walking around on the alert, you know, with our rifles at hand. You know, I come to a stairway going down into the ground. Well, in Europe, they used to have coal cellars and stuff. So I come around, look down the stairway, there's a, a German soldier standing there. So I said, come and see out. So he comes out. And six other guys come out after him. <laughs> you know, we patted them down. I wound up with a nice P-38 pistol from the almost brand new a German knife, which I still have. And, <laughs> and then we start crossing the open ground to get to a, the object, the original objective. And we were still getting fired at. And uh, one of our replacements came in who had come in a day or two before, he got hit, gone. No. Oh, an interesting thing, I'm gonna tell, I tell you. When I was in Camp Fannin, Texas, uh, the original basic training, we had a, a corporal, I still remember his name, Corporal Glazer. Now, when you're in basic training, you're a raw recruit, those guys are like gods. <laughs> you better not mess with them. <laughs> They're really tough. I, I guess they want to get you to be tough, too. So anyway, Glazer was that kind of a guy. All of them were. All the cadre were. And again, fast forward to combat. 
were overseas. I'm now a sergeant, and a good buddy of mine was our uh, staff sergeant. He was a platoon leader. I mean, Larry Tucker, and my one regret, I've had a lot of regrets, but that I've never seen him since the war. And I tried to find him, I couldn't find him. But anyway, we get replacements. Corporal Glazer is one of the replacements. <laughs> Still a corporal. <laughs> now I outrank him as a sergeant. <laughs> and I told Larry, my buddy, who was platoon leader, I said, see that guy over there? I told him, is you want him in your squad? <laughs> I guess for retribution or whatever. I said, no, no, I'll put him somewhere else. I have no grudge against him. <laughs> but he wasn't with us long either. I think he got wounded and sent back. So. Let's finish that story about the, the prisoners of war you took that night. Well, we just sent them back, lined them up. Oh, yeah, oh, I forgot. I'm glad you asked me that. Because we had a, a small factory that we were going to take over, but it was, we had to go over open land to get to it, and they, had, they were shooting at us. So what we did, we lined them up, the seven prisoners, and kept them between us and the guys who were shooting at us and made sure we stayed right in line with them. <laughs> because I can recall uh, bullets, or not, you can't see them, but you can hear them if they're close enough. And uh, I got, one of our guys was in the field uh, about 20 yards away from us. And I, he, I heard him holler, he got hit, you know. So they were shooting at us, but we, let, we kept the crowds between us and the gunshot. And then we turned them in. They sent them back to uh, the rear, you know, put them in the Uskow, I guess. Hold on to them. Wow. <laughs> you may hear from Eric Holder. <laughs> <laughs> so where were you when you found out the war was about to end? Where were you? Well, I'd been wounded March 26th, and I went to uh, they uh, went to Division Clearing Hospital and gave up my loot. I had that P38 pistol. I had an antique pistol, and I had oh a drafting set. I I was a sort of a, I wanted to be an artist or something, and I had looted <laughs> a drafting set. And I gave them all of the medic when I got, I said, here, John, take these. I know they're going to be taken away from me or stolen. We heard rumors you get back to division clearing, you lose stuff. Mm -hmm. In fact, I always carried a pen. That was gone when I woke up out of the ether. <laughs> but anyway, we went back to division clearing and then sent to, uh, wound up in Liège, Belgium. And we went by a uh, plane or truck. I forget how we got there, but I can recall lying on a stretcher in the open at the, in Liège, and I hear all these German voices around me. I thought, what the hell is that? What did I, what, did I get captured or what? They were paw, uh, paw, paw bears, <laughs> stretcher bearers, <laughs> and we were using or the uh, people there, the soldiers, they were using Germans as stretcher bearers, you know, putting the work. And then from there, we flew to, they flew us to, uh, to uh, England. And I was in the hospital in England when the war ended in Europe. And again, I was mad as hell. <laughs> because I helped win the war. I, and here I am in a hospital, and everybody, other than even the Navy, they're kissing girls in Times Square. <laughs> so, and, but then after a while, they took us up then to uh, Shannon, uh, Ireland, Shannon Airfield in Ireland. We went up by, they took us up by ambulance, come to think of it. So we saw some of the countryside, and then flew us in. I think C-47s back then, they were cargo planes, but uh, they were using them in our case to get wounded vets back to the States. 
So we flew from Shannon, Ireland, to uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, Nova Scotia, down to Mi Billy Mitchell Field, Long Island. And they kept us there for about, no more than about three or four days. All they wanted to do while we were there was find a hospital for the type of injury we had and send you to the nearest one to your home. So, you know, people could visit and stuff like that. And so, but the, in that day, I was there two days. Those two days we went to three parties. <laughs> and I tell you, it was really wonderful to think that people cared that much. <coughs> we went to one, and I believe it was at the Forest Hills Country Club, which is a very famous country club. And this is the one that it chokes me up when I talk about it. it. The reason it happened at all is a bunch of Jewish newsboys sold scrap paper just for this purpose. And we were all, uh, when we left the hospital, uh, we were, of course, not in uniform, pajamas and robes. And we went to all the parties in pajamas and robes. <laughs> I can't remember the other two, but three nice parties, dinners, lunches, and all that. And uh, much later on, when Vietnam was, the vets were coming back, and I think of how they were treated. But uh, and then, oh, then I went to uh, after two days at uh, Mitchell Field. I wound up in uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia, at the Newton D. Baker General Hospital because they handled uh, nerve surgery. I had a nerve. S shrapnel, sh 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 shrapnel, <laughs> that's a tongue twister. Sh uh, severed a nerve in the, in, my, in the knee area, and they, could, uh, they put it back together. Uh, but it never really, uh, never the way it had been. Even to this, to this day, for 65 years, I'll go to bed at night, and I can't get to sleep because two of my toes feel like they're burning. They're on fire. Oh, and in the last, what, the last, this last year, or six months to a year, I've fallen a couple of times because the big toe does not move. I can't elevate it or drop it. And if I'm barefooted, like at home I fell, and I tore open the, the toe, bled like a stuck pig, twice, because I stub it. I, you, know, you know what drop foot is? Well, I have that, not extreme, but, so you have to be aware. What, you can't just walk normally. If I walked over a tile floor and it's happened, and one tile is a sixteenth of an inch higher than the other, I could trip. And that's happened too. So I've talked to people at the VA. I go to the VA, tell them they act like that. Well, you know, nothing we can do. <laughs> but uh, all in all, I've always told people that when I'm talking about the war, I, said, I think it was a grand experience. All these young kids who probably would never leave home otherwise. Grand experience providing you survive it in pretty good shape. And uh, of course then add to that the GI Bill that we got. And I've often said anybody, any GI who didn't take advantage of that, they were crazy. Free college education, wow. It really helped me. I mean, when I was at Notre Dame, I, w I thought I wanted to be a chemical engineer. And then when I had the chance on the GI Bill, 
I thought, I don't know. I thought, uh, I always had a flair for art. So at, in Hoboken, New Jersey, at the Stevens Institute of Technology, the Army had a set up. If you proclaimed or told them what you wanted to do, what courses you what career you wanted to follow, they had a uh, set up there. They gave you aptitude tests to see if you were uh, could do it, you know. And they determined from what I did that, yeah, you, you, you could go to an art school, and they recommended an excellent art school, Rhode Island School of Design. And uh, I didn't know anything about it at the time, but after I went through there and uh, many years of designing and all of visiting, uh, visiting with uh, other people in the art field or design field, oh, you went to the School of Design, wow. And uh, so it's been, uh, it was, I had a great career, really. And uh, what else can I say? Let me ask you, the generation that's alive now, what can they learn from the service you provided? Well, there's so many things you can learn. Well, of course, some of the things you can't do anything about. Uh, we couldn't do anything about Adolf Hitler. But we can do something about, oh, if the Navy SEALs were around at that time, we might have been able to do something about Adolf Hitler. But uh, I think, what can they do? Well, they can pay attention to politics. So it's up to the citizens to use their heads. It'll never happen, I don't think. And read about all these guys, learn all you can to see who you want running the country. Sure, there's a lot, of, a lot of other things that take into consideration, but just be aware of what's going on. Because a lot of people don't even vote. Mm -hmm. They don't care. How many times have you heard people complain now? In fact, right here I heard a guy, oh, I'm sick of all these political ads. Well, who isn't? <laughs> but how are you going to change it? You you got to be aware of what's going on. I don't know what else. Education is, I think, is whatever you're doing, whether it's fighting a war, or is most important thing to get you started. Oh, there's so many things. I enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, I think I've said enough. <laughs>